Thank you, Warren, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm in a little bit of a uh, weather shock. I, I now know what it's like to live in Phoenix. Uh, boy, this is, uh, this is really tough duty. It's amazing how much uh, 220 miles north uh, the weather is different. Our last lesson in the book of Proverbs together, the big conclusion, uh, beginning in verse 28 of chapter 31. Proverbs 31, 28, speaking of the virtuous woman, this woman of valor, which the word means strength, essentially. We do a little bit more word study on it this morning. Verse 28, her sons arise and pronounce her blessed. Her husband praises her. 29, many daughters do valiantly, but you surpass them all. The word surpass is an interesting word. We'll look at that. Uh, 30, charm is deceitful and beauty is fleeting. As for the woman who fears the Lord, she should be praised. Uh, if there is one verse, I think, that is antithetical to our world, our culture, it's this verse. Verse 30. This verse needs to be shouted from the rooftops everywhere and should be common knowledge among the Christian community. It is totally antithetical to the world. 31. Extol her for the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Uh, throughout the book of Proverbs, I have hardly ever finished on time. Today, it's going to be shorter than we would expect because uh, we're wrapping it all up right here. Uh, we begin this section this, uh, in verse 10 with the husband's praise of his wife. A valiant wife who can find. And now we are to the conclusion of that opening. Calling upon the community as well to praise this woman of strength. See verse 28, her husband Praises her, verse 30, praise, verse 31, praise. Three out of four verses, praise, is noted in association with this woman. The emphasis we have seen from the beginning, she is simply a blessing. She provides for others. You know, we say when we go visit someone that's ill or dying, and we walk away and say, they encouraged me more than I encouraged them. That's what blessing is. That's how we bless one another. We build one another up in encouragement. And that ministry is, I think, been set aside a lot. It shouldn't be. It should be prominent among us all. Building one another up, encouraging one another, and that's what this woman brings. Power and blessing. Uh, and she does it to her husband. Verse 12, she does him good and not evil. And now as the sun sets on the passage, she is going to be recognized, rightfully so, for all that she has done. And let me say, it just seems to me that we don't do enough of that. We don't recognize 
one another enough for the work that they have done in the past or even in the present. We need to be doing that, building one another up in encouragement. That's important. And specifically somebody that's struggling, come alongside of them. Get out of your own skin and come alongside of them and build them up. Encourage them. You may or may not know what they're going through, but if you do, that's your primary responsibility. And you ought to be busy and about it. So recognition should be extended for a life of blessing, power, and potency. I was uh, asked uh, to speak before uh, my distinguished friend, Mr. Dan King Duncan, was to deliver a paper on Dr. S. Lewis Johnson to the faculty and the board of Westminster Theological Seminary. And uh, I thought, you've got to be kidding me. You're asking me five minutes before I'm to stand before this august body, and you want me to say something? And uh, I'm frantically looking for a napkin. Nothing happens without a napkin uh, for me to write some notes. And finally, with seconds before I am to get up, I just said, look, just tell the audience what his ministry meant to you. And so I got up and was able to say at this event for Dr. Bruce Walkey at Westminster what his personal ministry had meant to me in my life because I knew those things naturally. We need to do that. Encourage one another. You have meant a lot to me over the years and over the times that we have been with one another in fellowship and in friendship. So, gentlemen, give your wife praise. Praise your wife. Often, always, without exception, build her up. It will strengthen your relationship in marriage. In sum, this woman does not fear. Verse 21, she laughs at the face of the future. That's not arrogance. That's confidence in God and what the Lord will do in the future. And we need that, don't we, men? a wife that will encourage us and because I'm always a guy with the glass half full and I don't look at it uh, as something positive but my wife is resilient and she encourages me and we should be the same with one another we need their input we are weak in that area often and always. This uh, word in verse 28, by the way, there is no uh, Hebrew uh, letter that we can uh, align for our own alphabet. So we'll skip that. Verse 28, uh, her sons arise. It's a different word from verse 15 where she arose early in the morning before the sun comes up. This is different. This idea means that uh, in the same manner of her husband, these sons praise her. Sons are, I take to be personal family members. Uh, there's a dispute of that in the commentaries, but I take it as personal because the husband was personal. I think you have to read a little bit outside the lines to think that that is community. Although community is what the husband is calling upon for this woman to be praised. 
One of my favorite westerns, 1965, The Sons of Katie Elder, John Wayne, Dean Martin, Eric Holloman, Michael Anders. Katie was a woman of great virtue, respected in that small community, town, and she died. And her boys, who had been less than stellar, let me say, all come back to settle up her affairs and make sure that all of her wishes are granted at death. And there they find that there has been something wrong in the town. And Katie had opposed it. And so they looked into the matter and it was all around the wicked Morgan Hastings. <laughs> At the end of the show, they prevail, of course. John Wayne, right? And, uh, and the last scene is the living room. And there is the fireplace. And this fire's going. And there's Katie's rocker right in front of the fireplace. And in the last scene, it's rocking mysteriously back and forth telling us that Katie is very pleased now with her boys that they have settled this matter. Well, here we have the rising of the sons and the rising of the sons in like manner to their father pronounce a blessing, vocal esteem for the skills that she poured not only on them but into them as well. Their lives have been lived productively because she taught them the Scriptures. And that's better than any Harvard diploma anywhere. Her husband praises her. This word praise, probably the most predominant use is in the Psalter, Psalm 150. Praise, 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 praise. That is the word. Glowing attribution. Uh, the husband is giving his wife glowing attribution. You need to be doing the same thing. Often. Always. Here is verse 29, and we have an English equivalent of the letter R. Verse 29. Many daughters do valiantly. Literally, do valor, we would say. It's from the word to make, to produce. It is actually our word strength that we referenced at the beginning. Verse 10. Strength. And there, when we looked at it, valor, valiant, strength, we reference Psalm 84 in verse 5. Blessed is the wise man whose strength is in the Lord. And so that is what these boys are doing, praising their mother for her strength in the Lord. It wears well, and it wears well over the years and time. Many daughters do valiantly. Our top line opens. From the sons, verse 28, to the daughters of verse 29. The many is always going to be the case. Because the many are out there. The many make up the population of the world. Many. Many women in your life. Many in the ordinary course. But what is this verse saying? Verse 29. That the wise woman, the woman of skill, 
She, in effect, overcomes them all, passes them by with her wisdom. She is superlative over and in every case. The word means to advance against. Let me tell you where you find it. Surpass. 2 Kings 20, verse 1. It's interesting. The Lord tells Hezekiah he is going to die. He says, put your affairs in order. You will not recover, or some translations just read live. You will not live. That's our word, advance against. In other words, you will not advance against the illness that I'm going to bring to you, says the Lord. So, what is the idea here? Well, it, surpassing and advance against, let's try to smooth it all out with English. Advance over. That's the idea. This wise woman advances over the ordinary women in the world. She accomplishes more. She drills deep into life. And she gets things done. That's this word. Many daughters do valiantly, and they should be recognized and honored for that? Yes. And for that they should be praised and praiseworthy, but this woman right here, this skilled woman surpasses. She advances against. She advances over them. This woman is simply exceptional. I have met several like that in my life exceptional people. Verse 30. This one, you have to really understand your grammar, so I'm going to walk you through it. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is fleeting. As for a woman who fears the Lord, she should be praised. Notice, first of all, we have a style change. Did you recognize that? In verse 29, we had you. You surpass them all. But here, we move back to the predominant she, which is what the narrative has been all about. Let me show you. Look at verse 12. She. 13. She. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, where she makes her husband the centerpiece of her life. And so she has been the predominant word used in the narrative. And then we come to verse 29. Now we have identified it. What is that about? Well, the you is the voice of her husband. Her husband is the style change. Now, here's what I want you to see grammatically. Now, the last thing we want to do after getting out of school is talk about grammar. But grammar is very important, and here it is. Charm and beauty are not the recognizable feature of this woman. Charm and beauty are not the recognizable features of this woman. She may be charming. She may be beautiful. 
But that is not the point of the verse. I didn't write it. Look, just the opposite of the unwantedness of a John the Baptist or Elijah the prophet. They were um, intimidating characters, uh, foreboding images of men. Uh, I often thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to have an Elijah the prophet walk right into this very fine uh, establishment uh, cocktail party with everybody all dressed up and refined and so forth. Well, those were rugged men and they were intimidating men. That is just the opposite of this word charm. Deceitful. It's actually the opening word in the inspired text. It's parallel to our final word in line one, fleeting. Let's discuss them both. First of all, deceitful. What you think you got, you didn't. You got deceived, tricked. That's what the word means. Here's the second word, fleeting. It is puff of air. That's what it is. And it's used throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, and we translate it vanity, nothing, emptiness. What is the verse saying? The, worm, uh, the woman of charm and beauty is not praiseworthy according to this wise man who is describing his wife. So, charm and beauty are deceptive features. And he's telling us that. Meaning, they don't last. They're here and gone. They're like the, the roaring fire truck with a siren. It catches our attention for a bit because it has flashing lights and a big red engine, but it soon goes right out of our mind. That's what he's saying. All of this charm and beauty that the world absolutely caters to and gives all time and attention to is contrasted with this valiant woman. That's what the grammar of the verse is saying. Who is at all times like the image of Mount Rushmore, consistent. In season, out of season, whatever time, whatever place, whatever temperature. I told my son on many occasions as he was growing up, you marry character because character endures. Uh, I have been up close and personal with two men in my life. One's a believer, one's not a believer. They nursed their wives as best they could till their last breath. And I told them both individually, you're my hero. And you are the example. So I tell the non-Christian, Phil, I just want you to know that I'm going to put you in my lesson Sunday in Dallas at Believer's Chapel. Oh, 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 that's really a big deal. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, but I'm putting you in there because you remember when your wife Mary died nine years ago? And you remember after everything got all settled out and you and I had a chance to talk, I told you how much I admired you, how much I appreciated you, respected you, 
because you were there in the thin, thin of the worst of your marriage vows. You were there. And he goes, well, you know, Mike, I, uh, I've, uh, I've done some things I'm, I'm, I'm not proud of, uh, uh, but I've tried to live a good life, Phil. Let's don't go there. Not right now. I just need to tell you, I'm putting you in this message. The other man is, uh, is a believer. And he was there to the bitter end. I don't know everybody's story here, uh, but if you were there for your wife, you are my hero, believe me. That is a wonderful, wonderful thing to, ac- to uh, give you note for your goodness, your kindness, all to the last breath, to the bitter end. That's wonderful. You ran the race. You finished. You broke the tape in that relationship. And that is something to be recognized for and attributed to. Now, I always ask myself this question. Why do older men divorce their wives and marry younger women? I was with a, a man I did a lot of business with in Amarillo, Texas. And I can remember him saying to me, you know, she just makes me feel so young. She just makes me feel so young. And I, I pondered that for a while, and I realized, you know, that is just what your life is about, feeling. There's no substance there. There's no substance in feeling. We have all kinds of feelings. I feel this, I feel that. Doesn't make it right or wrong. Doesn't describe north or south. What do you mean feelings? Feelings are nothing. Yeah, that's... Uh, it, it, it's a commentary on the man. Because it tells me that his life is all about himself. That's what I got. Line two. As for a woman, that's the name given to her in the garden. Here her husband boldly declares, she should be praised. Now here is something that's very interesting to me. In Psalm 22 and verse 25, fear and praise are linked together in worship. So, what am I saying? You worship your wife? No. Here's what I'm saying. You worship God for the wife He gave you. That's what you do. In every stage of your life, the Lord God is front and center. He brings you your wife. He did in the garden. He brings you friends that stick closer than a brother. That doesn't make any sense, does it? That's what He does. He brings people to you. And as I often say, The game will come to you. You just be faithful and wait for Him. The game will come to you. God will bring it there. Just like for Boaz. How did Ruth find that field? Of all the fields in all of Israel, she found that field. How did she get there? And then there's this large shadow that comes over her while she's busy working. And that is God's will for her life. You can't miss it. So, the husband worships the Lord 
for the wife he gave him. And then I sit across from a guy and I'm, look, I'm getting this, the reflection of his Rolex watch across my eyes. You know? <laughs> and he says to me, uh, well, you don't know my wife. Uh, no, I don't know your wife. But I do know that uh, Ephesians 5.25 is not a condition. What are you saying? Well, Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Uh, that's not a condition. If, or when, or how. That's a command. And he didn't want to talk anymore. That's a command. Well, I don't get much out of my marriage. I don't get much out of my relationship with my wife. Okay? Understand? Are you loving your wife? Uh, is that... That's a command. Are you doing that? Well, okay. Let's just start, forget tomorrow, yesterday, let's just start today. Are you going to do that today? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. Then do that and sit perfectly still. And wait. God's at work. God's always at work when you're being faithful and doing what He's called you to do. You don't have to figure anything else out. As I said many times, the faithful life is a putt, just about like that. The rest of it, the Lord will take care of. Sand traps, the fairway, the deep rough, and all the pine trees and so forth that would keep you from getting the ball in the hole with the least amount of strokes. All that the Lord will take care of. You just be faithful. Be ye faithful. So here we are. Verse 31. Acrostically, we come to the letter T. Extol her for the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. You see, the fruit of her hands and works are both parallel. We've been together long enough in Proverbs that you see that automatically. We're talking about one and the same thing. Described one way in line one and a different way in line two, but they're parallel thoughts. So there's not two ideas here. I want you to notice the two commands. Extol and praise. They both express a wish. Now, with these commands, something happens grammatically again to the text. Look at all these things that are happening here at the very end. We move now from narrative to direct discourse. What does that mean? It means get your finger out. He's talking to you. He's talking to you. Directly to each of us for what she does. What she does, that's the fruit of her hands. That's her works. She should be praised for that. And it is what this woman has accomplished that has changed the style of the writer, her accomplishments. 
The name of this woman is not only to be recognized now by the husband, by the children, but by the believing community. And the establishment of the believing community is that word gate right there. That's the important place in the city, place of commerce, the place of business, the place of courts, etc., etc., in the ancient world. In other words, her name is to be given great dignity among men everywhere, even into the highest places of the land. That's the text. Now, what I want you to see is how that practically works. And so I close the book of Proverbs by quoting Boaz in Ruth chapter 3 and verse 11. He says to her, And now, my daughter, do not be afraid. You know, she has gone from Moab into Israel and cut off all the ties to go back to Moab. Now she is in Israel and an Israelite. And now, my daughter, do not be afraid. I will do for you as you ask. Now here is the attribution. All the people of my town know that you're a woman of noble character. That's the reputation that precedes you. Who you are today is the way people see you and will remember you. So, what will they remember you for? Charm? Beauty? Doesn't last. Very low on the totem pole. And yet, that's what the world values more than anything. So much so that these Hollywood actresses, now they so stretch their face, and you look at them and you go, who is that? I don't even recognize that person. They were in what? Ah. But the godly woman, she's deep. She has character. And she affects people with her manner and her means. She is to be praised. Charm is deceitful. Beauty, fleeting. But this woman, she stands the test of time. Gentlemen, get off the dime and praise your wife. Anything and everything that you can, praise your wife. It will change your relationship. And that's what we all desperately need one day at a time, don't we? To renew that relationship as God would have us. The Proverbs are over. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. So grateful for this class and the opportunity to teach this book. Uh, so grateful for the wisdom of God that comes to us in a thousand forms and in a thousand different directions. But it, it imbues us with the wisdom that we desperately need, the skill for living each and every day until we're in Your presence. So grant us Your grace and goodness each and every day that we live to glorify God. And we will do that in His precious name. Amen.